and it is time what is up everyone welcome back to the hacks motor twist channel or if you're watching this after the fact welcome to my youtube channel my name is tyler ramsby and we get to hang out this evening and have really something fun that we are going to dive into this evening. I have access now to the AWS Learning Pathway on TryHackMe, which is a business exclusive. And I know there's a lot of hype, a lot of questions around this, whether or not it's worth it. And what I want to do is let's just dive into it together. This is going to be my first reaction, my first time working through this material. I have purposely not looked at this material uh, today because I wanted to just dive into it together. So I have not planned this. I've not pre prep this this is going to be my first reaction and we will see uh if it's good if it's worth it and what we can learn from it so with all that being said let me go ahead and share my screen for those of you on twitch let me know if everything sounds good looks good i have no good way of monitoring that so if no one's yelling at me in the chat i'm assume everything is good on your guys's end if it's not though let me know if the audio sounds off or if the video looks off or if my face is blocking stuff uh let me know so here we are Attacking and defending AWS. You can see a brief description here, and we have all of this that we're going to dive into. Now, my uh, just for some context, I work at Rhino Security Labs, which is like known for AWS pen testing. We created a entire thing called Cloud Goat, which is like a vulnerable AWS scenario, or not scenario, really a framework that you can deploy in your own AWS environment to learn AWS pen testing. And that's really where I have learned AWS is through Cloud Goat. I actually have a room on Try Hack Me that will be coming out soon. It won't be like a public room because it requires you to set up your own environment, but this room will be in the Try Hack Me style, but it will take you from having nothing to creating your own free tier AWS account all the way to launching your first scenario. And then I created another walkthrough room that guides you through one of the Cloud Goat scenarios to get you hands on with that. So if you don't have access to this right here, um, Cloud Goat is free, but it does require setting up your own environment. So just stay tuned for that. I'll be announcing that uh, later with all that information for you. But that's kind of my experience with AWS. But guys, I'm still an AWS noob. So I've only shadowed about two AWS pen tests. Generally, what I do is web app pen testing. I don't do AWS yet. So I'm still a noob at AWS. And so I fully expect I'm going to learn some good things through here as well. And the kind of downside of Cloud Goat, at least right now, is it really just throws you into the deep end, like sink or swim, and you kind of struggle your way through it, where this looks like a more gradual introduction to AWS and uh, attacking and defending AWS. When I was glancing at it real quickly, it starts out with some theory stuff. So these first couple of videos might be a lot of reading, a lot of theory, but that'll be good because we're going to cover it from the ground up. And the other thing about this is I know most of you do not have access to this pathway. And so you get to live the pathway through me, my goal. So I have access to this for a month and I'm hoping in this month we can cover everything. I don't know if I'll be able to get to it, but that is my goal so that on YouTube on my YouTube channel, if even if you don't have access to attacking defending AWS, I will have every single module recorded reading through the full text of every single one. So that even though you don't have a business account, you don't have access to this, you'll still be able to get the content. Um, I reached out to try hack me and they also graciously gave me full permission to stream it. They told me nothing is, is uh, limited. So I can stream this entire path. And we can study this stuff together. So Without any further ado, my friends, let's go ahead and dive into it. We'll begin with an introduction to AWS. Looks like our goal is to learn about the unique characteristics associated with cloud technologies and core fundamentals required to use AWS. The one caveat I do want to share, guys, that might be different from other content creators you see is I like to read this in its entirety. So if I have comments, I'll add them, but I'm not going to skim it. I'm not going to try to summarize it because it's easy to miss stuff. And I want you to, to get content out of this since you probably don't have access to this. I want you to feel like we're sitting down together and you're getting access to this pathway. So I'm going to read everything in its entirety and let's dive in. We'll begin with the drink of water. All right. We're going to begin with the very basics. Uh, AWS Cloud 101, an introduction to AWS and how cloud has changed computing. I'll zoom in so you guys can see this okay. Learning objectives. This room is intended to provide users who are not familiar with cloud technology, which I am familiar, but let's let's do it anyways. Insight into some of the cloud's unique characteristics. Students in the room will learn about how current cloud capabilities evolve from humble beginnings at AWS and other 
early internet companies, why cloud technologies have changed how individuals and corporations interact with IT infrastructure, and how business non-tech benefits have helped drive cloud adoption, and free resources and documentation that AWS has created for the public. This information will help you become familiar with AWS even if you have never used a single cloud technology. These tasks will help you understand the broader story arc of where the cloud has been, is, and therefore where the cloud may be going. Now, a little bit about my background. One cert that I do have is uh, about a year ago, I got the CCSP through ISC Square, which is cloud secu- certified cloud security practitioner, I think is what it stands for, uh, the CCSP. A good cert, but it's vendor agnostic. So it doesn't go deep into AWS or Azure, but it's an overall picture of it but it's not as hands-on as, as I was hoping, but that is a solid certification that would be good on, on a resume. And I got that just a little over a year ago. So if anyone's studying for that, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to share with you the resources I used. Looking over the chat, OXO112 said, can you make a video about reporting on YouTube? Maybe, <laughs> maybe one day. Reporting is just different depending on what pen testing company you work with. Where I work, we have our own system in place that makes reporting a breeze and makes everything awesome. I don't like write up a word document or anything like that but would be happy to give some basics of it i think tcm security also just came out the video about how to write a good bug bounty report which might fit that category so check out that video all right i am ready to start the room cloud enters the scene the on-prem model organizations have been hosting their own it infrastructure in one form or another since the 1970s long before i was born but during the late 1990s dot com boom Organizations began to have widespread business reliance on internet-connected services. To serve these needs, companies drastically expanded their data center footprints. As the data center business grew, it became common for third parties to manage data centers on behalf of their customers. The cloud. At first, the cloud often meant hosting servers in someone else's data center. Rather than managing a fleet of servers running 24-7 with bare-bones IT department at a smaller, medium-sized company, organizations would offload this responsibility to a third-party provider who specializes in managing IT infrastructure. Eventually, providers develop custom software to manage the large fleets of infrastructure, networking gear, and servers that have been deployed. While perceptions persisted for some time that the cloud was just someone else's computer, this room is designed to cover some of the unique characteristics of cloud providers and specifically AWS. All right. What decade did companies start having widespread reliance on internet connected devices? 1990s. More scalable. Starting in the late 1990s, websites could not handle the traffic coming their way from the ever growing World Wide Web. Just curious, what were some of your guys' favorite websites from the late 1990s? Um, I remember spending a lot of time on Neopets. I don't think, is Neopets still a thing? Y'all remember Neopets? Oh, shoot. Neopets is still a thing. Amazing. I remember Neopets. I remember old school RuneScape, like like older than old school RuneScape. When you go to old school RuneScape right now, I remember the RuneScape that was before old school RuneScape, y'all. I remember playing that. Um, Dark Ages, Tibia, some classic MMOs. That was my my life. And really in the early 2000s. Uh, as the 2000s started, a number of technologies came onto the scene to address these needs. First, there were content delivery networks, or CDNs, that would serve static content on behalf of a website. Then along came AWS EC2, a virtual machine service that allows customers to deploy additional servers on demand. So guys, one big thing to notice about AWS is they have the dumbest names for their services. Their names do not make sense. You have to Google, like, what the heck? Why don't they just call it an AWS virtual machine? No, they got to call it an EC2. And you'll notice that about all their services, they have such confusing names. That's one thing that frustrates me about AWS. You have to constantly be Googling or chat GPT and we discover a new service to figure out what their weird, obscure name actually does. Evolving approach. While originally a simple service designed for customers to leverage a pool of additional server c- capacity, the program programmatic nature of EC2 deployment allowed developers to create automated scaling workflows that were the early predecessor to EC2 auto-scaling. While third parties initially created auto-scaling services, AWS released the official auto-scaling feature of EC2 in 2009. Leveraging auto-scaling, a customer can specify how to scale infrastructure in response to a wide variety of static and dynamic conditions. Though it may not seem significant, this change dramatically improved technology teams' ability to manage operational costs and improve flexibility under changing demands. 
Since EC2 and auto-scaling, AWS has created a number of ser services that further enable scalability. Technologies that support cloud-native architecture are a key component of AWS's strategy. While this training won't go in-depth on cloud-native concepts such as containerization and serverless capabilities, you should have a general idea of what these are and, what they, and that they represent additional building blocks that help create highly scalable infrastructure. Looking over the chat, Five Shot said, what are you doing? We are doing the AWS uh, learning pathway on TryHackMe. All right, auto scaling allows scaling any type of application, containerized or non-containerized, and maintains application availability to meet customers' demands. And we can see a picture of this. We have containerized applications deployed to Amazon EKS, which is a container management service and ECS. Non-containerized applications deployed to general EC2, remember virtual machines, auto scaling groups then we have this amazon ec2 auto scaling and then you can see everything it does it provisions amazon ec2 instances scale capacity to resist demand which you can imagine let's say you are a school supply company because i'm thinking of school supplies for my kids you're a school supply company much of the year you have pretty low demand so you don't need a bunch of servers you don't need a bunch of data but when it comes to August and September, all of a sudden it ramps up significantly. What the cloud allows you to do is ramp up your production so that you can serve your customers better. That's kind of the beauty of the cloud that you don't need to use all the services all the time, but when you do need them, they're available for you. And that's just explaining some of this stuff. Okay, cool. Was EC2 auto scaling the first auto scaling service in AWS? Was EC2, I think so. Okay, nope, nay. What was the first one? In AWS, right? AWS released the official auto scaling feature for EC2 in 2009. I don't know. Apparently it's not though. Whatever, let's keep going. <laughs> Bottleneck says CDNs, but it's specifically as AWS. It says, as the 2000s started, a number of technologies came on the scene to address these needs. First, there were content delivery networks that would serve static content on behalf of website. Then along came AWS EC2. The question asked, was EC2 auto-scaling the first auto-scaling service in AWS, in AWS itself? Which that seems to say, yes, it was. But, I mean, who cares? Let's just, we'll keep moving. I'm probably just mis misreading it, misunderstanding it. Legacy on-prem pattern. Prior to the cloud, failover cap capabilities for data centers were often manual and highly customized for the technology stack of a particular organization. This often took the form of a primary and backup data center that were geographically separated using a common virtualized infrastructure, i.e. VMware, that was replicated in both locations. However, organizations were forced to spend a substantial amount of time and energy trying to gracefully fail over between data centers or risk a prolonged outage in the event that a primary data center outage occurred and failover attempts to the secondary data center were unsuccessful. Furthermore, organizations had to maintain a backup data center and the eye popping associated costs only for it to sit idle for extended periods of time. I think that's where it talks about like a hot backup and a warm backup and a cold backup. Cloud patterns. AWS and other hyperscale cloud providers have a distinct advantage in reliability for a number of reasons. One key reason is that AWS runs a large number of data centers, which means that they can gather data and insights about the failure of their systems that would not be feasible for most orgs with only one or a handful of data centers. While specific numbers are not clear regarding the number of data centers, AWS claims to have 99 availability zones in over 31 regions at the time of writing. Let's unpack what that means. Region. Well, AWS defines a region as a physical location around the world where we cluster data centers. A region will be made up of one or more availability zones. These data centers that make up an availability zone will all be located within 60 miles of each other in the given region. Though not every AWS service is available in each region, and some services are not bound to a specific region, AWS architecture is designed so that most services are available across a wide number of regions. Not all AWS services are regional, some global like Amazon Route 53, Firewall Manager, etc. Availability zone. An availability zone is one or more discrete data centers with redundant power, networking, and connectivity in an AWS region. These separations mean that an outage of one availability zone due to 
due to lost power, networking issues, or ISP connectivity issues should not affect any other zone. AWS further intends for availability zones to be the key failover capability required by end customers. In fact, during this 2018 reInvent, which is their annual talk, the speaker highlights how AWS regional services are designed to withstand AZ failures. While this perspective has been challenged by real-world experience, which it has been, applications built on AWS are generally considered to be highly resilient if deployed in a multi-AZ configuration. The above figure illustrates that a single region can contain multiple availability zones. So here is our region, and then within this one region, we have different availability zones. So if this one goes down, this one's still up, and vice versa. You can recognize an availability zone based on the letter following a region name when working with virtual private cloud-bound resources. For example, US East 1 has the following availability zones, A, B, C, D, E, and F, right? So it's easy as one, two, three. Naming conventions. Perhaps you have generalized AWS naming conventions from the examples above. For those who don't see the pattern, AWS names regions and availability zones are based on a common naming convention. For regions, names commonly start with one or a few different designations. AF, AP, CA, EU, ME, SA, and US. A cardinal direction, north, south, east, west, and central, or a combination, southeast, northwest, is appended to the abbreviation, abbreviation based on where the region is inside of the geography of the region. US East for those data centers could considered to be in the eastern USA. The convention follows with a numerical designation, one, two, three, etc., based on whether it is the first, second, third region within the geographic location. For example, AF South 1 is located in Cape Town, South Africa. It is a region on the African continent, AF, and the southern portion of the geographic area, South, and the first region, 1. There are other designations that are less common, such as U.S. GovCloud and those associated with AWS China, but the general naming convention can provide you with helpful context as you use AWS. How close together in miles should an availability zone's data center be? I think it was 60. I was right. Awesome. <clears throat> Five Shot said, you should read a book called Designing, Designing Data Intensive Applications. Is it good? I'll check it out. All right. Drink of water. I'm telling you guys, if hacking doesn't work out, I'm just going to start reading books for Audible. Data Sovereignty. On August 25th of 2006, AWS launched EC2 in the U.S. East 1 region located in Northern Virginia. A short 15 months later, AWS launched a European version of S3 object storage due to the need of European customers to keep data in Europe. This was the beginning of a common theme and an important concept to understand about cloud technology. While customers in the U.S. have enjoyed the benefits of AWS since the beginning, other countries may have data sovereignty laws or regulations that dictate which AWS region will host their company's technology assets or even whether the associated data can be hosted in the cloud at all. At present, AWS hosts regions on every continent except Antarctica. Come on, get good. And in many key locations with data sovereignty requirements, we, we need to start Antarctica AWS availability zone. Notably, AWS China is even a separate partition, which means that AWS China accounts are managed entirely apart from other global AWS accounts. AWS also maintains separate partitions for US Gov Cloud, US government secret data, and US government top secret data. While these are the known AWS partitions, there are like the others, including internal AWS partitions. Latency. Beyond the hard requirement of data sovereignty, data sovereignty, Geo, Geo distribution serves the dual benefit of allowing AWS customers to host internet facing resources in a geographic location near where customers will be at the time of access. Even though data travels through fiber optic cables at nearly the speed of light, latency can increase dramatically over physical distance. This is additionally important due to search engine considerations about site latency, where search engines are a primary driver of traffic for many sites. Sites that consistently exhibit poor latency are unlikely to receive high search engine rankings. AWS customers may take advantage of geo distribution in a number of ways, but one notable way is through the use of CloudFront, the AWS Content Delivery Network. CloudFront has over 275 point of presences, where a point of presence is a physical location serving internet traffic. 
CloudFront enables intelligent traffic routing and caching for end user requests with minimal configuration by the customer. Finally, the AWS region concept raised in the previous task provides an ability to geo-distribute workloads by strategically deploying applications and workloads in regions that are anticipated to have high-end user traffic. AWS DNS Service Route 53 allows customers to route traffic based on traffic geolocation. In combination with EC2 Elastic Load Balancers, this can allow AWS customers to ensure they are serving non-static resources with as little latency as possible. Uh, what continent has no AWS region? The penguins, Antarctica. I can't spell. There we go. What country has its own AWS partition? China. Operational expense versus capital expense. Cloud, a business solution. While this course is focused on security associated with AWS, it is important to also understand the business value of cloud versus on-prem data centers. After all, companies only use technology so that they can make money. A key concept to understand related to the business value of the cloud is the notion of capital versus operational expenses. CapEx versus OpEx. In business, a capital expenditure expense is a major purchase of goods or services intended to be used by a company over a long period of time. In contrast, operating expenses are expenses incurred as part of day-to-day -day operations. In the past, organizations were known to pay in excess of $1,000 per square foot for data center build-out and configuration. Using that pricing, a 1,000 square foot data center would cost a million dollars. With the expensive nature of data centers, cloud providers saw an opportunity to create a different approach. Essentially, every wasted compute cycle represents poor investment dollars spent. The inefficiency was dramatic when calculated across industries. At a hyperscale, as cloud provider environments are called, costs and operational efficiencies are inherent relative to any specific company building a data center for internal company use. Cloud allows a pay-as-you-go and reserve capacity model to better manage IT expenses rel relative to the organization's IT needs. Furthermore, cloud highly optimizes workloads for efficiency, bin packing, virtualiz virtualization management, networking tricks, etc., resulting in more efficient operational costs that can be passed on to end customers. Finally, only spending money in assets that are currently in use has the advantage of enhancing operational agility. Rather than being committed to the sunk cost of CapEx, which is what I was talking about with my um, example with like the school supply company, cloud providers allow organizations to change the size and types of technologies in use based on today's business needs, not based on decisions made five years ago by a different group of business and IT leaders. All right. Is a major purchase intended to be used by a business over a long period of time a capital Expense or operational expense? It'd be a capital expense. API mandate and the two pizza team. The API mandate. Even prior to the formation of AWS, the CEO of Amazon, the great Jeff Bezos, Bezos, whatever his name is, issued a mandate across Amazon that internal teams would be required to make their data accessible to all other teams via a service interface, aka API. As the legend goes, the specific mandate stated the following. Number one, all teams will henceforth expose their data and functionality through service interfaces. Two, teams must communicate with each other through these interfaces. Three, there will be no other form of enterprise process communication allowed no direct linking no direct reads of another team's data store no shared memory model no backdoors whatsoever the only communication allowed is via service interface calls over the network number four it doesn't matter what technology they use http cobra pub sub custom protocols doesn't matter five all service interfaces without exception must be designed from the ground up to be externalizable i think that's a made-up word. That is to say, the team must plan and design to be able to expose the interface to developers in the outside world, no exception. Six, anyone who doesn't do this will be fired. Seven, thank you. Have a nice day. <laughs> this integrated approach to data management provided the key to AWS's early success. It turned out that creating standardized APIs to interact with AWS services and resources is the key capability to unlock automation for AWS customers. Because teams always had a plan for external customers to use their services, customers rapidly benefit from the unique capabilities AWS develops. Any customers who interact with AWS services are ultimately interacting with service APIs. In many cases, the very same APIs that AWS employees use. The two piece of team, Jeff Bezos, Bezos, 
Bezos, I think it's Bezos, Jeff Bezos, that I have it, that sounds right. Jeff Bezos commonly encouraged his perspective across AWS with both positive and negative effects. Another such example is the two pizza team rule. Bezos famously stated his claiming, we try not to create teams larger that can be fed by two pizzas. The reasoning cited was that smaller teams foster collaboration. While it is true that his this collaboration likely led to much of the innovation we appreciate from AWS today, it also had another effect. AWS has over 300 services a day, and each of these services is run by a different team. That makes sense. When developing APIs and API naming conventions, consistency is key to usability for end users. Unfortunately, with the various AWS teams, there's a lot of variety in the naming conventions. Yes, there is. When using services that may have similar capabilities, end users can't rely on those APIs being consistently named. With the need to be precise with programming grammar, these inconsistencies can lead developers frustrated and extensive digging through service documentation or asking questions to ChatGPT. Uh, who announced the API mandate? That's the Jeff Bezos free open source capabilities built in advantage when you use aws you have access to a large number of services pre-configured to get you up and running quickly whether your need is a website a database or a continuous integration continuous delivery pipeline aws already has capabilities ready to go for you but beyond the services themselves aws has made large contributions to the open source software space these contributions include a wide variety of tools to enable AWS services, along with pre-built solutions to general business IT problems. To use an example, cloud, cloud formation is an infrastructure as a code service that allows users to deploy complex resources into an AWS account using predefined YAML or JSON templates. Beyond providing the service itself, AWS provides reference implementations and sample templates for various AWS services that users can take and customize or adopt as is. This goes so far as to include a fully functional airline booking application developed by AWS that you can deploy in your own account. So if you happen to start your own airline, I mean, that's my next plan. Hack smarter airlines. You can be up and running in no time. Service tools. One notable type of open source software offered by AWS is ecosystem tools. Ecosystem tools are tools that AWS has created to help users with the AWS service ecosystem and include things like AWS Data Wrangler, advertises Python Pandas for AWS services, AWS Shell, integrated AWS CLI, and AWS Lambda Power Tools Python. What, what, a, what a very brand worthy name enhances AWS Lambda functionality. As these tools and capabilities are not widely advertised, AWS customers may not be familiar with many or all of their capabilities. However, as an AWS user, you should research and be aware of AWS services and example code before attempting to develop custom capabilities. <sighs> what is AWS's native infrastructure as code tool? I don't know. Um, I actually do know I'm blanking out. AWS cloud formation. That's right. I've actually come across that. That's one of the things we check in pen tests is, is, uh, like if there's secrets stored in cloud formations, cause you guys can imagine you think about uh terraform and like infrastructure as code. One mistake developers and sys admins will often make is they will hard code creds into their hard code credentials into that. And those credentials aren't changed. So when we are, uh, checking out a client's environment and their cloud formation stack, that's one of the things that we're looking for is, is there hard coded creds here? Are there secrets hard coded into this that should not be there? All right, serverless and other low code solutions. The genesis of serverless. When AWS created S3, Simple Storage Service in 2006, few could have foreseen the shift in approach it would facilitate. Services like S3 and Object Blob Storage Service, DynamoDB, a database service, and SNS, a notification service, dramatically reduced the effort spent on initial configuration and ongoing management of IT infrastructure. Serverless also has the benefit of little to no operational cost when idle. This means that if users aren't accessing your application and performing activities, you can incur significantly less costs than with web service servers running at the same cost regardless of use. These benefits were immediately clear. However, the serverless capabilities that AWS has brought into existence since then provide integrations and capabilities that would have been hard to foresee back in 2006. Today, organizations that use AWS have access to a wide variety of serverless services, say that three times, 
with a vast range of support tools and reference, reference implementations. For a developer, there are a few ways to go from an initial idea to a functional, scalable, and publicly accessible application faster than using AWS serverless capabilities. Low code, no code solutions. Beyond pioneering a wide range of serverless capabilities, AWS also developed low-code, no-code services. These services allow developers, and in some cases, users without programming skills, to develop custom code and capabilities in AWS with minimal configuration. AWS Honeycode, like what, what kind of name is that, is an example of a pure no-code solution offering a drag-and-drop interface for building web apps and static websites. AWS Amplify, once again, what kind of name, requires a bit more technical skill but has become very popular for allowing developers to quickly build mobile and web applications. These types of service offerings include a wide variety of other services beyond web and mobile applications. Services such as AWS EventBridge, at least that name makes sense, allows AWS customers to build new applications and integrations based on custom or pre-existing application workflows. While still in the early stages, AWS and other cloud providers are working to create software development workflows that don't inherently require programming skills. And I'm guessing AI is really gonna help that significantly. Does serverless cost more or less when running idle than traditional servers? Less. I think I hear fireworks. I hear banging. I want to make sure it's not my kids. I'm quite certain it's fireworks. Guys, I live in a town where fireworks are fully legal. You can do whatever you want, like right outside my house. There are no rules on it. It's like a war zone uh, this whole week. You walk outside, it's just smoky. It smells like sulfur and there's bombs going off everywhere. All right, summary. During this room, you've learned some history about cloud technology and the basic benefit of using the cloud. You should now understand, one, how technology limitations in the 90s and 2000s drove the development of cloud technologies. Two, how capabilities associated with reliability and scalability are hallmarks of cloud service providers. Three, how companies may see cost and IT agility benefits from using the cloud. Four, how an API first approach was powerful and also had drawbacks. And finally, how AWS provides various services, capabilities, codes, and documentation for free. This background knowledge should serve as helpful context as you further explore cloud technologies and specifically our other AWS rooms. Let's have a small test, shall we? Click the view site button at the top of the test to launch the static site and split view. What is the flag after completing the exercise? All right, you've been tasked to develop a social media interaction website where users can communicate with each other with features more or less equivalent to those on Twitter or Facebook. You are tasked to get input from all the teams, prepare a feasibility report, and present it to the CEO. You will visit each department and will be asking certain questions. You will only be given 30 seconds to answer each question. Oh, my goodness. I was going to have you guys answer the questions, but I believe the delay between where I'm at right now and Twitch is about a minute, so that's not going to work. In case of running out of time, you get a penalty. Your game will be over after three penalties. So uh, they're going to be asking certain questions. We'll be given 30 seconds to answer this question. Let's go. Click on the department to visit. All right. The software engineering team mentioned that the complete team is housed in California. Therefore, they need a high availability server in that region. In case AWS is selected as a cloud service provider, what would be the naming convention of the region? In California, US. Which of the following service will be used to route traffic based on users' geolocation? In line with Jeff Bezos' model Amazon, each developer of our software team will expose data to other members through a service interface called API. Okay, beautiful. DevOps room. The website will be accessible from all over the world. Shall we deploy all the infrastructure in our on-prem or go for cloud services? What is the most practical reason for selecting the cloud service model? Lesser latency rate for website users and ease of scalability. On-prem infrastructure cannot host a website. No. On-prem solutions have security risks. No. Okay, this one. All right, finance room. The payment will be made to cloud service providers on a pay-as-you-go model, and the infrastructure will be expanded per the needs. Which of the following expenses is, opt is optimally used in this case? The payment will be made to a cloud service provider on a pay-as-you-go per the needs. Which of the following expenses is optimally used in this case? Optional? Operational? What do you mean? What do you mean optional? Is optimally used. Optional is not a payment model. Which of the following expenses are optimally used? An optional, that's, I, I think that's a typo. I don't know. 
uh, the website will be accessible from all over the world. Should we deploy, or is this just my instructions? Oh, this is just like the answers. Okay. There we go. There's our flag. Boom. We finished the first room. And hey, guys, this is what I'm going to do because we'll probably be hanging out for a while tonight. Since we finished a, a room, this is a good um, break point. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to actually uh, stop recording for YouTube. Uh, for those of you on YouTube, you can just jump to the next video when this one is over. For those on Twitch, I'm not actually done, but I am going to take a five-minute break. Let's take a five-minute break. At the end of the five-minute break, we will dive into the next part of the AWS Learning Pathway. So on YouTube, thank you for watching. Just jump to the next video, and you'll be able to keep going. For those of you on Twitch, just hang around for five minutes. I'm going to throw up a five-minute countdown, and I will be back in five minutes. Let's go.